Welcome to the podcast Road to Inclusion from the Atlas Alliance. In this podcast series, we'll cover themes such as disability rights, disability inclusion, the empowerment of persons with disabilities, inclusive international development aid, and disability inclusive humanitarian action. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the podcast Road to Inclusion from the Atlas Alliance. I'm your host, Gagan Shabra, and I'm the project manager for inclusion at the Atlas Alliance. And right now, today, we have an exciting, phenomenal, insightful guest with us here in the studio, Gru Lindstad. Gru is the executive director of Focus, which is one of the most important organization promoting the rights of girls and women with disabilities and girls and women in general across the globe. And it's based in Norway, Oslo. And we'll have very interesting conversations with Gru about the Global Disability Summit, about the theme of girls and women with disabilities, the multiple forms of discrimination encountered by them when it comes to patriarchy. We'll take a deep dive into a little bit of intersectionality and the perspectives linked to that. And how do we ensure that girls and women with disabilities feel empowered, feel engaged, and have a sense of inclusion in the broader Global Disability Summit. So before we could jump into all those topics, which, is, which I'm very excited to discuss with crew, a little bit of description about myself. Right now, I'm wearing a black leather jacket. I'm wearing a black T-shirt. It's The T-shirt has the doors. Uh, it's a band from the United States from 60s and 70s. I have long curly hair. I'm wearing red shades and there's white wall in the backdrop of the studio. And welcome, 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 Gru. Thank you very much. And with the Doors t-shirt you have on, it's like sitting here with riders in the storm, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. We're going we're gonna to ride a nice road to inclusion together. Absolutely. In this podcast. Absolutely. So, Gru, uh, if I may ask you to just describe yourself um, to the audience who are or sight impaired, vision impaired, and who uh, might be finding difficulties to watch you. Certainly. Um, I'm actually sitting here in a relaxed outfit, just as you are, and uh, I have uh, jeans on. I have a, um, an olive green uh cashmere a hooded top on just to keep me warm in this Norwegian weather. And um, I'm about 176 tall, but I'm sitting down now. Um, and I have um, grayish hair, which happens with age. So uh, with that, I'm also, I just turned 62. Um, and, um, I've been doing this work, um, working with civil society and being part of civil society and, and, uh, have been working, uh, with different organizations since I was, what, 17, 18. So, wow. um, so it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to sit here with you because you're one of the most prominent feminists uh, in Norway and uh, you have been working for decades on the theme of gender equality, gender inclusion, gender mainstreaming and, uh, and it's, as I mentioned, um, a privilege and we are super excited to have this conversation with you. So, so Gru, for the rest of the audience, if you might just give some milestones concerning your biography and your work that'll be great sure and and i i mean first of all i would like to say that I, i'm the one who's thrilled to be here and i was so happy when i got the email from you asking me to do this because um i think it's such an important thing to um discuss, talk about, to keep in mind when we talk about women's and girls' rights, that we talk about the whole perspective of who is a woman or who is a girl. And we'll get into that later. But just to say that um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, about me and my background, I am um, I started off in youth politics, actually, um, and, and started off on, on the more conservative part as um, I was a leader of uh, uh, the young conservatives, Unga Heire, 
um, when I was in um, Vidrogone School, as a high school. High school, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, started off there um, and uh, went to law school. When I started law school, I uh, early on um, asked to be part of uh, YUTC, which is uh, the organization that gives legal help to women, and it's all women students, women law students. Um, so I was there. I was also there a manager for a year um, before moving on. Um, eventually jumped from uh, Ungahera, Young Conservatives, to uh, a different party, more on the, le the left side. <laughs> um, I've um, kind of done uh, work both with, um, I'm also a lesbian, uh, open and visible and, and, um, clear on that inclusion too. I was the, I've been active in the LGBTI movement since early eighties, have been the leader of the Norwegian LGBTI movement and have been active also internationally. Um, I worked as a political advisor in the Norwegian parliament for a number of years, also working there with um, immigration, defense issues, and foreign policy. Wow. Have um, been a country director for the Norwegian Refugee Council in Croatia and Bosnia after the war in former Yugoslavia. I've worked for the UN, uh, UNIFEM, becoming UN woman uh, stationed in New York, which was a, a fun time. And then um, and working with Focus since January 2011. So um, I think one of the interesting things is that I've been sitting on all sides of the table. I've been both civil society, I've been the UN, and I've been uh, in politics. So that has been very valuable in trying to understand all sides and, and seeing how to strategically smart working with all sides. Yes. Absolutely. You know, it's fantastic to hear your eclectic background because, and the thing which you said in the end, it's so important that if you want to get to inclusive change, if you want to implement inclusive change, you've got to have a broad coalition of partners, stakeholders, and you've got to convince them that this is an important issue. Girls and women with disabilities, their inclusion is an important pivotal issue. And if you want that to happen, you need the support of the parliamentarians, you need the support of the civil society, the private sector, the civil, the, the mainstream organizations, and the OPDs, Organization of Persons with Disabilities. Very, very, very crucial. And thank you for being so candid about your identity. You asked a very interesting and leading question. Uh, uh, who is a girl and who is a woman? Well, what do you mean by that question? Well, what I mean with that question is, is that, you know, as I, I'll use myself as an example, I, as, I mean, I'm a woman, but that's just kind of one of the layers of being me. Um, in addition to that, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, a Norwegian ethnicity or origin. I'm a lesbian. Um, and, and then you can layer on, um, I'm, um, not member of state church, so I'm not religious in that sense. And, you know, which is what we, in a non-understandable word to a lot of people call intersectionality, but intersectionality is, I mean, explained, it's the fact that we are more than just one label. And and that's why we, as women, girls, and also working with uh, promoting gender equality, have to have, you know, one than more more than one thought in our head at you know at at a time, because you have to think that people act differently in different contexts, and you have to include all. Yes. Oh, you're spot on. Our identity question is is one of the most fundamental questions. Who am I? And the moment you start describing yourself, the moment, as you said, like I'm a woman who is having Norwegian ethnicity, uh, who is 
I'm blind, so I don't know. You're white, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good. And then, and then, as you mentioned, like in in the previous intervention, that you are lesbian, and all these elements: uh, your sexual orientation, your gender identity, your uh, your ethnicity, your socioeconomic background, your education that you studied law, the fact that you traveled and lived in different countries, all of this part of uh, constitute grew. Lindstad. So our identities are multi-layered. So it's absolutely spot on that what you said, that girls, when you think about just girls and women, it's a broad category. So we've got to kind of drill down, understand the different layers. And one of the layers, which I am curious to explore with you in this podcast is the girls and women with disabilities. You know, because in the disability movement, what has happened for far too long often is that um, the girls and women with disabilities are kind of marginalized, are oppressed, are excluded, are not given center stage in the conversation. Just to throw a statistic, for instance, there are 1 billion people with disabilities globally. And out of those 1 billion people, if you check the prevalence rate of men with disabilities, it's 12% of that 1 billion. You know, like the population of the globe is the population of the globe is say six billion. Out of that six billion, fifteen percent we say is one, approximately one billion people with disabilities. And if we drill down, twelve percent of that one billion category is men. When it comes to women, it's nineteen to twenty percent. So there are a lot of lot more women with disabilities, girls with disabilities in the global south. It's an important demography which kind of feels gets excluded so you work for focus from 2011 it's now 11 years what kind of projects programs does focus does to promote the interests of girls and women with disabilities in the global south if i can start off more overarching saying that focus form for women in development is an umbrella organization like the Atlas Alliance is, and, and we have um, Norwegian women's organizations and groups as members, and uh, now we have 50, you know, ranging from uh, all the political parties, women's caucuses, groups, to some of the large labor unions, to more, um, you know, the, women's organizations, uh, diaspora organizations, to student organizations and the LGBTI movement in Norway. So very broad range. And um, we have a strategic plan where we define what our thematic areas of work are. And, and the reason we have the strategic plan is that um, we aim to work on issues that we have experience on and are good at, and that does not overlap what all other organizations work with, because, you know, doing good development work is also not choosing the same as everyone else. So our thematic areas of work are uh, women's economic empowerment, women's economic rights, um, sexual and reproductive health and rights, violence against women, and uh, women, peace, and security, and then as a intertwined into all areas are uh, gendered perspectives to climate change, which affect women across. And um, we also have uh, worked on and have had ever since I've been with Focus um, policy that we've developed on how we include broadly also women and girls with a disability. Um, we had training actually with help from Atlas to develop this. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the perks of working together as umbrellas across our organizations that we learn from each other. So we've learned a lot from Atlas on uh, how to do things right and have also um, been inspired by some of Atlas's partners in countries where we work. And then we've trained Atlas on gender equality. So, you know, it goes back and forth. Um, and then to your question of how do we work, 
I'll I'll give you a couple of examples and um one of them is that we do training with all our uh, partners in the countries where we work in Eastern Africa and Latin America. And for example, in, in Uganda, we've um, um, had the assistance of an organization in, in Uganda uh, called Nudipu. And they are actually one of Atlas's partners. So they've trained organizations we work with to be uh, raising their awareness and to also ensure that we have inclusion in our work of also uh, women and girls with disabilities. And for example, in Uganda, we uh, run a large program in, in one of the largest agricultural districts, uh, which is called the Lovero District, where we've um, worked with organizations to form collectives where uh, or co-ops actually of of women small scale farmers who get together and join forces so that they can learn from each other and also reach larger markets one of the co-ops that have been developed consists of women and girls with a disability and um We've created, or the organizations that we work with have created uh, different income developing um, programming and projects. And the interesting thing has been also that um, in this co-op, not only the women and girls come, but their whole families come mm, yes. because it actually um, involves the whole family and 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 the income actually is good for the whole family. So they do everything from growing mushrooms to uh, making handbags to um, different things. And they actually, I visited them um, late 2019 and they were very enthusiastic because they actually have been able to make quite a lot of money that goes into a um, common box where they actually the, the the different families can ask for small loans to actually develop further so that's one of the things we do um and we also look very clearly at being inclusive in all the programming we also do on sexual and reproductive health and rights Wow, like uh, the example or the anecdote you gave from Uganda reminded me of like amazing bottom-up grassroots mobilization, creation of self-help groups, which could be leading to microfinance opportunities and all led by, managed by women in general and including women and girls with disabilities. Well, that's a fantastic way of uh, of bringing change. And when you said that the families get involved, I'm like, wow. Of course, they get involved because often girls and women are the center when it comes to making a home. So what I mean by that is men might go out and get some work done, but it's the women who stays at the home, goes out to the field, gets the education for the kids, becomes a homemaker, at the same time does the responsibilities of working. So this is a wonderful, wonderful example wherein you are giving chance to girls and women with and without disabilities, a chance to be economically independent because the moment they become economically independent, they, they feel stronger, they have greater voice, they have greater influence to change their homes, their communities, and thereby the societies in general. The bedrock of change, I think, is the empowerment of girls and women with or without disabilities. Cool. And in that context now, Guru, if I may ask you, you might have heard of a thing called the Global Disability Summit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, were you involved in the Global Disability Summit 2018 when it happened in London? Uh, no, I wasn't. I, I just, um, you know, it was on my radar, but it was... Uh, Let's say that focus was in um, uh, a challenging year that year. So uh, all our energy was focused at home and, and not on much else. 
but we survived. And, and with the Gender Disability Summit coming up now, we have been involved in a totally different way um, and have had discussions with Atlas also of how to um, incorporate the gender perspective into this so that it also becomes the prominent part of it that it should be. Oh, absolutely. Because the reason why I talked about the Global Disability Summit is because one of the core overarching cross-cutting team, uh, which was there <clears throat> in 2018 and which is still there in 2022, is this focus on girls and women. As I said, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which came in 2006 and is now ratified by more than 180 countries globally, it says categorically that girls and women with disabilities encounter multiple forms of discrimination. Of course, there's discrimination coming out of disability, which is common, like, dis like um, uh, stereotyping, stigmatizing, prejudices and the rest. But there's also barriers which are coming out of for, for the fact that these are individuals who happen to be girls and women in the society where they find themselves. So it's a very important uh, issue and a theme. So if I may ask you for the GDS 2022, which is now less than a month ago away, <clears throat> what would be your expectations from that summit and what would be your aspirations? I think I think one of my expectations would be that we um, could have discussions that actually move us forward in line with achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 um, with the challenge that now has been created by the pandemic that is still um, affecting um, the world uh, affecting globally and, and where we have a long way to go and where it actually has shown in general that COVID-19 has affected women and girls harder than men and boys. Um, you know, we, we, the statistics show that more men and, you know, have died from COVID, but women and girls have been affected um, harder by more women and girls um, spiraling back into extreme poverty, losing their jobs, uh, majority of women in informal sector, and, and they've been the first to lose their jobs, uh, girls who are dropping out of school and not coming back, um, who are being married off too early, or who have um, become pregnant because there is uh, no you know comprehensive sexuality education for them so i think that um i expect discussions and inclusion of women and girls during the gender the the disability summit to be on equality thinking that you know, if if we're a soccer team, you do not win the match if half of your team is on the bench. <laughs> Absolutely. Spot on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's why this conversation, this podcast is so important because we have to center the themes of gender equality, gender mainstreaming, and gender inclusion within the broader rubric of the Global Disability Summit. We've got to tell individuals that girls and women with disabilities, their concerns with regards to their education, with regards to sexual reproductive health, with regards to the fact that they, they are more prone to abuse and violence in the case of this pandemic, the moment they kind of drop out from the school is a lot higher. And uh, what you mentioned is, is very, very critical. So as an individual, Guru, because you have been one of the more stronger voice feminist voice from Norway. And as an organization rep representing Focus, what would be one accomplishment which you would want to see out of coming out of the Global Disability Summit 2022? That this one thing, which, if it comes out and you'll be like, wow, that's something which is good, which will help our movement. I think that both the Norwegian government, Norwegian authorities, and other authorities in different UN member states 
prioritize this beyond the Global Disability Summit. You know, I've been in this game so long that I, I say that I'm 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 tired of just being part of a political speech during a conference that has an empty echo once the conference is over. Yes. Um, and that we need action and no more not you know before more action plans, we need more action. And I think that's what I would say that the Disability Summit should lead to more action. And, and, you know, with the fact that in Norwegian development policy, if you look at statistics, only 3% of all the money that is being used um, can be traced back to being used on, um, you know, disability inclusion. disability inclusion. Yeah. You know, and, and it's also a paradox because if you use the same statistics and look at how much funding is being used specifically and, and, and with the major target being uh, women and girls, it's only 8%. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the reason it's higher in, in, in total is because um, organizations are crossing off the box saying that it's part of what they do, but only 8% is solely what they do. So I think what we need out of this uh, summit is to have um, some real promises being made that this is going to be prioritized and not just talked about as a marginalized group issue, but as um, an issue that shows total inclusion. Absolutely. So all words and no action is not the way forward. We need to kind of ensure what you mentioned uh, that and to have actions and not just action plans, make nice rhetorics and not follow it up. And some time ago, you mentioned about how focus is like this umbrella, which has different organizations coming from different walks of individuals and coming from different walks of life, dealing with different issues. And what I feel is that when focus and Atlas collaborates, learns from each other, works together with each other, we kind of stand in a much better chance to build a much more cohesive, broad-based coalition, which can promote the gender equality issue and the gender inclusion issue for girls and women with disabilities. So that's extremely, extremely important. Uh, if, if, if I may take your, your input on, for instance, your long history of dealing in civil society, Norwegian parliament, as well as um, the UN system, do you want to give a piece of advice to the organizations, to the members of the Atlas Alliance who are currently involved in the preparation for the Global Disability Summit? What advice would that be? I think my advice would be to um, try to cooperate broadly to instead of um, being very eager to promote your own organization, promote the issue. Um, too often we are so eager to promote our own organization and our own work because we're fighting for the same money that we tend to lose a little sight of the fact that we're actually working for the same um, goals. And I would also say that um, it's important to um, also work broadly on a political scale with, you know, um, all parties and all fractions and, and also try to think strategically on smart partnerships with others. I mean, for example, with the fact that Atlas and, and Focus work together because we have something to gain together. Yes. Um, and my last piece of advice would be, and this is something that I say when I talk to um, both government and parliament, is that I would like FOCUS to be an organization that 
comes inside to have meaningful conversations and uh, where we probably will disagree on issues yes. and 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 um not come to agreement but instead of standing outside barking or pissing at the corner it's much better to be inside and actually sit down at the table and and uh, i've never known any time where it's not useful to talk with each other no, absolutely. We need to have open-minded, honest, candid, good faith conversations. And one way to bring inclusive change is to have those dialogues across party lines, across political affiliation, across organizations, across uh, interest groups, because that's how you end up building a momentum. That's how you end up realizing inclusive change. Uh, you, you mentioned about focusing on issue and not the organization, which is one specific issue which you which kind of inspires you to get up in the morning and say, wow, this issue I'm going to fight for today. And how could, uh, how could that be kind of roped into the broader Global Disability Summit uh, rubric? One issue that um, really both engages me and also at times makes me extremely mad is, is looking at uh, women's and girls' health. I mean, one thing is looking at the fact that it's not being prioritized um, and that it's being uh, pushed away and, and not uh, given the funding that it needs. And, and I mean, I have a story actually that has stuck with me that um, happened a few years back. I was in Tanzania. Um, doing uh, a report on climate change. But while there, um, I was invited with a colleague to a feminist um, conference that uh, one of our partners then in, in uh, Tanzania had and asked to speak on uh, women's sexual and reproductive health and rights. So uh, we had a side event, did so, packed room, and I was talking about inclusion um, in general, and um, there were a number of questions from, you know, different um, people in the audience. And then there was a comment from a woman who was in a wheelchair, and she said that uh, it was so good to hear that we were doing the work that we were doing, but she wanted to tell us about how when she and other women in Tanzania had contact with hospitals, doctors, nurses, um, when, for example, they were trying to get pregnant or when they got pregnant, they were um, met with aggression and asked, how dare you? because um, they were not looked at as being suitable to being parents. And she was also saying that coming to a hospital to give birth, um, the hospital beds and everything else was not fitted out to accommodate them. And I think it's something that is so essential and that is a right. And that is not being prioritized because, you know, we're, we're talking about in development work, health in general, but we're not seeing the whole picture. So I think that's one of the issues that we still need to do a lot of work on. Absolutely. Like that anecdote kind of reminds me of the attitudinal barriers encountered by girls, women uh, with disabilities, um, that how dare you become a mother? Can you be a mother if you have a disability? And shouldn't you be responsible and not uh, propagate your genes further? So all those questions about uh, uh, at a philosophical level takes us to the idea that there is 
the persons with disabilities are not seen as equals, as not seen as those who have human dignity, human worth, and especially those who, if they happen to be girls and women with disabilities, then they get even more marginalized, oppressed, and uh, treated mu much more worse off than men and boys with disabilities. Yeah, and it's also, to me, an example of you know, Tanzania has has ratified the the yes. uh, convention on the elimination of of uh, all discrimination against, against women, women and Sina. girls. Yeah, uh, which also has very clear uh, regulations coming to health. Absolutely, but um, it's only used on the uh, majority population and yes. not on. Um, you know, minority parts of the population. Exactly. And one thing is to ratify the convention. The other thing is to implement it, Absolutely. to follow it up with uh, with action, what you said. And we need action when it comes to gender equality, gender inclusion, gender mainstreaming, and combating discrimination against girls and women with disabilities and empowering them to, to, to be fully participating in the societies wherever they find themselves and thrive like any other individual can. So, Guru, one last quick question. What is it like to, to be Guru Linstad over the weekend? What do you want to do? How do you, are there, are there some activities which kind of keeps you engaged beyond, beyond, you know, arguing for, advocating for gender empowerment and gender equality? Oh, absolutely. Um, I am, um, Someone who I really enjoy reading. Uh, uh -huh. So I have, um, I'm actually during this uh, pandemic, we actually had renovation in one of the rooms in our apartment. Uh -huh. So it actually is now fitted to be a library and I really enjoy sitting there and I, I have too many books that I haven't read, but yeah. uh, they're on my, all on my list of, of wanting to be read. Um, in addition to that, I am, um, I'm not a singer, but I really enjoy music. And, um, you know, one of the kinds of music that I really like are musicals. Oh. Um, when I lived in New York and worked for the UN, I had uh, tickets for musicals and also theater on Broadway at least once a week. So um, um, that's something that I really enjoy. And I also try to get out uh, here in Oslo and go to concerts and, um, you know, explore different kinds of music. So you can't put me in a box and say, oh, she only <laughs> likes musicals because I might as well put on, um, you know, something rap or hip hop or... The um, doors. Or the doors, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the good, the, the the good old doors. The good old doors, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, that that is fantastic to hear because uh, there's no way in which Gru Linstad could be put in a box because Gru Linstad uh, is uh, is an individual who has incredible, rich experience, has multi layered identity, like any other individual, and and I'm just so elated for the fact that you took time out and talked to us about the important theme of gender equality, gender inclusion, and gender mainstreaming and and bringing this to the global disability summit because we definitely need to center accentuate the concerns expectations demands of girls and women with disabilities living in the global south thank you guru for this opportunity uh, if you get a chance to all the listeners viewers check out the website of focus they do a phenomenal job as guru mentioned in africa in latin america as well as uh, go to the global disability summit.org website check us out there as well as the atlas alliance website and you'll find valuable resources and the global disability summit will take place from 14 to 17th of february and we hope that it is going to be engaging, exciting, enlightening for all those who could participate it digitally around the globe. Thank you, Guru. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And to all your listeners, please join the summit and, and uh, let your voices be heard. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into this podcast episode. I hope you found this conversation engaging, enlightening, and a little bit entertaining. And if yes, then I hope you get a chance to follow the other episodes as well. And please subscribe and share the podcast series Road to Inclusion.